Hi, good afternoon. This is Sean from Inventory Base Academy. Um, I'm hoping you can all hear me. I shared my screen with yourself. So hopefully, again, you can see all of that. I just wondered um, if someone could maybe just let me know that you can see and hear me well. All good, lovely. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Ian. Hello. Uh, thank you, Simon. That is absolutely brilliant. Um, we're literally about a minute or so away. So I'll just wait to see if um, anybody else is going to join us and then we will start. Um, just while, we, while we're waiting to like, literally start the session, um, if you do have any questions, do feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, I'll try and answer them as we go along. Um, I'm hoping that the, uh, the actual webinar will be around about 20, sorry, 30 to 40 minutes maximum. There will be a recording of it and we will share that with you and also put that on our YouTube channel as well. Um, so um, if for any reason you can't stay or if there's any other reason why you can't um, hear or see me, Properly. Hopefully you'll be able to see all that um, on the video, on the recording rather. Um, just while I was getting ready to um, start talking to you, um, I'm having loads of problems with keys today. So still hands on Clark, still got Clark's out working today. And typically keys are going missing left, right and centre. But I know all of you guys, that's exactly what we all have to deal with each and every day, unfortunately. But um, seems to be particular right at this very moment in time with literally a minute or so to go before the webinar started. So that's my day so far. I hope your day is going a little bit better, but at least, well, at least down in here in Bournemouth, um, it's sunshine, so that's quite nice. Right, so we're just one minute past, and I'm obviously very conscious of all your time, um, so I'm going to start now. So um, I thought it'd be really quite useful for everybody to look at the telltale, telltale signs um, that we look for at checkout. Some of them are going to be kind of very straightforward, and you think, yeah, I, I see that all the time. I know exactly what I'm looking for. Others, maybe not so much. So um, I thought it'd be a, a good webinar to do. Let me just change the screen. So what we're going to be looking at today is landlords and tenants, who is responsible for exactly what in regards to their responsibilities for the property. Um, the seven signs that tenants may not have looked after the property, and that's like your obvious um, signs, but also your not so obvious signs. We're also going to quickly touch on fair wear and tear and whether it is actually is fair or not. And also what to report and when, because that's really key. And funny enough, we've actually got a discussion in the um, support hub for Infantry Base Academy on Facebook, looking at apportioning um, responsibility um, and actions, etc. So it's quite a bit of a hot topic. And hopefully in the next week or so, we'll be launching a new course, which is all about apportioning liability and understanding exactly where our responsibilities lie from uh, an infantry professional point of view. So hopefully you'll find that all useful. So lands and tenants, who's responsible for what? So starting off with landlords, the landlord is responsible for most repairs in the home. Um, and some people think that's just private landlords, but it's not. It's your private landlords, your councils, your housing associations, anybody, to be honest with you, who's actually renting out a property. It could even be, uh, said, your normal HMOs, um, your normal residential, could be commercial, but it also uh, could be uh, rooms or Airbnb style type properties. At the end of the day, whoever it is that's offering that property or that room or that service, they're responsible for making sure that repairs um, uh, are taken care of and the property is maintained and it's maintained to a safe um, level. So the kind of responsibilities that in are included Electrical wiring, it goes without saying, especially now we've got EICRs in scope as of the 1st of April, um, all electrical wiring definitely down to the landlord. Your gas pipes and boilers, yes, they're serviced by um, a gas fitter or a gas safe registered fitter, um, but they are still responsibility of the landlord to make sure that they are maintained and are safe at the end of the day. And that includes your um, gas safety certificates as well. 
you're heating in hot water again it's all part and parcel of the fabric of the uh, property and certainly under uh, fitness for human habitation hhsrs it's the landlord's responsibility to make sure that the property is warm the tenants um, um, have hot water clean water safe water certainly from a legionella risk assessment point of view so that's again within their responsibility in their remit um, chimneys and ventilation. Um, I sometimes see it, especially in the rural properties where we've got um, open fires um, and the tenants got access and, and allowed to use those. Um, yes, it's the tenant's responsibility to clean them at the end of the tenancy if that's where they got were given it to them. Um, but equally, um, it's a landlord's responsibility to make sure that they are maintained and they're safe, they're not blocked, and that they're fit for purpose and then can be used safely. Sinks, baths, toilets, pipes, anything to do with um, that side of things in regards to sanitary wear, uh, cleanliness in the home, being able to have water to um, uh, do your washing up, do your washing, you know, all of that is part and parcel of a landlord's responsibility. Um, common areas, including entrance halls and stairways, there's always a bit of a kind of like, you know, we're not quite sure exactly who's responsible for that. But there has been some cases from a legal point of view where um, landlords, even though they've maybe just been the landlord of a particular flat, the actual communal area and the block of flats also comes within their remit. And there's still a, um, a health and safety element to owning that particular property that extends to the common grounds. So for argument's sake, um, we've come across where there's been trip hazards for paving as you walk into the property. Um, so a landlord is still responsible for that. He might not or she might not have the freehold um, but they are still responsible because they're paying towards um, those kind of repairs those upkeep so therefore there is a responsibility there and obviously that extends to stairways um, lifts should be maintained within the uh, the block management depending on how all that is done um, but obviously from a safety point of view they've got to be in working order and certainly the stairs have got to be clear and free of any potential trip hazards etc just to make sure that should there be a fire there's a way for the tenant to exit the, the building the you know the area etc so um, even though common areas from our point of view don't often get included in the report it's something to be aware of and certainly from my own point of view my own business if I'm um, looking at a flat and I've come across things that I think might be a hazard, I do let the um, either the agent or the landlord know. I put it in my report because it's potential safety hazard. And at the end of the day, we all have a personal responsibility from a safety point of view to make sure that we are all equally safe. Um, the structure and exterior of the building that kind of like almost goes without saying in respect of the fact that the that landlord is providing that property for the tenant to use. So anything structural like that, your soffits, your guttering, your roof tiles, anything to do with the external side of the actual physical property is down to um, the landlord. But there's still a responsibility there for the tenant to let the landlord know if there is any issues, you know, if there's a broken window, it's been broken from the outside, it happens. I've seen birds fly into windows and crack windows or, you know, external forces have caused the windows to crack. And, you know, it's down to the tent to make sure that landlord is aware. So they have the opportunity to sort out a, a replacement and a, and a repair of those issues. So certainly from a landlord's responsibility point of view, they've got quite a wide ranging um, list of things that they are definitely responsible both externally and internally. Um, and also the landlord needs to make sure the home is free of hazards. And I've already mentioned uh, HHS SRS and fitness for human habitation. Now, fitness for human habitation and the whole risk assessment has been in place for quite some time now. And yet I don't really see anybody doing them. I don't see much call for them, um, certainly from not from an agent point of view, which kind of doesn't make me wonder sometimes exactly why they think that way because if you did a fitness for human habitation before the tenancy then any issues could then be easily addressed ready so that when the tenant goes in you've got even less potential for deposit dispute going forward um, but for some reason they don't do that um, but certainly from a landlord point of view it is their responsibility to make sure the property is free of damp and mold now we know as providers, we see a lot of damp and I see a lot of damp and mould where 
maybe the property's not been ventilated, um, they're not using extractor fans, um, they're not opening up the windows, they're not airing the property, or they're drying the clothes in the property on clothes horses. We see that a lot. But that doesn't always mean that it's always down to the tenant. Sometimes you find damp and mold because maybe the damp course isn't effective or there's external factors um, that is really out of the remit of the tenant because it's part and parcel of the fabric of the building. And um, I don't know if you guys um, see this, but I see a fair amount of time where mold obviously exists. And then rather than tackle the actual source, what is happening is that they, uh, the landlords are actually painting over the molds. So therefore it's literally still behind the paint and then it's waiting to come through. Um, and invariably over time it will do. So that isn't necessarily a tenant's fault. It's not the tenant's responsibility, but it certainly is if it's coming down to the fact that they're just not airing the property or like you said, um, uh, drying clothes in the property, not opening up, not allowing airflow through. Um, Rats, mice and other pests, they are the responsibility of the landlord from a point of coming in to the property, getting access to, but it's still a tenant's responsibility to make sure that they um, literally deter that from happening, i.e. they don't leave food lying around, they keep the property you know, clean, tidy, they dispose of bins, making sure that you know, they use the bin service, the collection service that it, every household has. Um, so that um, it means then going forward, hopefully the potential for pests is less and less likely. Um, gas safety checks, they should be done every single year, as we all know. Um, and certainly if it comes to the point of checking and those checks aren't done, then realistically tenants should not be going in. Um, it doesn't always transcribe that that is exactly what um, happens, but that's exactly what should happen. And certainly now we've got electrical installations, the EICR reports um, now um, in scope. So that's all properties, all rental properties sh should have an EICR. Um, that again comes under to the landlord and then any kind of uh, remedial work that is picked up by those reports then should be done by the landlord. At the moment, we do have a problem with access because of COVID. Um, it's becoming easier and, and becoming less of a, an issue. But at the end of the day, um, it's still got to be done. It's a safety issue. Um, but obviously with COVID, we've got to make sure that, you know, if we're going into property, not us specifically, but electricians, gas engineers, um, that they take all that into account. But at the end of the day, it's a safety issue. So those need to be um, actually done on time and regularly. And then finally, you've got your fire safety, your smoke and your carbon monoxide alarms. Now, um, from my point of view, um, what we do is we check the alarms both at uh, inventory, again, at check in if we're doing that, although most agents at the moment are doing their own. And then um, again, at interim inspection and then again at checkout. And one of the reasons we do it at checkout is so that the client's got enough time then to get any remedial work done, especially if there's a quick turnaround. Um, so that the uh, tenant is going to be kept safe and that the property has all the working alarms that it should have. Um, so certainly, you know, that's totally within the landlord's remit. Um, but there are some exceptions to that, which I'm going to come on to. So a tenant's responsibility is about keeping the home in, in a maintained state, keeping it home keeping the home reasonably clean. Trouble with the phraseology there is very subjective. You know, what I would call clean, what you would call clean, what other people would call clean really does differ and, and, and can differ to a great extent. But, you know, I think clean, tidy, you know, work surfaces uh, wiped down, it's dust free, carpets are hoovered, you know, marks and blemishes are, you know, are, 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 are made clean. I think that's reasonable rubbish put out into the bins that are provided. So um, it's not a particularly difficult thing to do. I mean, albeit I know some people do struggle from that, especially if maybe they're vulnerable or got mental health issues, but certainly in the main, the responsibility de definitely lies with the tenant. Um, and just going back to what we we're saying about the landlords and the checks and the smoke alarms, it is down to the tenant to carry out the safety checks um, in regards to the actual alarms themselves. Um, but when it comes to electrical appliances that the tenant has brought into the property, then that is definitely their responsibility. Now, I know some landlords actually will get the tenant to um, have a pat test done on the items that are going 
into the property to make sure that they're safe. Um, and also because once they're plugged in, they're, they're plugged into the system, to the, um, the fuse board, et cetera. And so to minimize any potential issues. Um, but I don't actually see a lot of that happening. I certainly have never seen um, a landlord insist on a tenant's uh, items being pat tested, but when you think about it, they really should. Um, gardens and outside areas in a reasonable state, again, very, very subjective. Um, I have seen gardens that are patchy, um, tune up, um, been used as the uh, pet toilet for want of a better phrase, um, or just with items and stuff littered everywhere. And the tenant feels that that's perfectly acceptable. Um, there can be argument in regards to what, how a tenant lives and how they give back the property. There are two different things in as much as, well, as long as the tenant um, isn't causing a safety issue, as long as the tenant gives the property back in a similar or reasonable condition, bear in mind fair wear and tear, then where's the issue? Um, but the problem with, certainly with outside gardens, if they are left in that kind of state and they just build and build and build, and that could be actually be seen as like antisocial behavior because they're creating rubbish, which then could create a um, place for pests, uh, pests, uh, mice, rats, et cetera, to accumulate. So they're actually almost like encouraging that issue to happen. So gardens do need to be kept in a reasonable condition and certainly something you should be looking at at interim inspection and then commenting on that both in the report to the landlord and or to the tenant depending on how you do your service um, but a reasonable state to me would be you know lawns cut you know place uh, the uh, grass or bedded areas weeded um, and it just be kept rubbish free and neat and tidy as much as possible in regards to minor maintenance, um, the law um, from a uh, fair wear and tear point of view do think that um, tenants should be looking after property and changing things like alarm bel uh, light bulbs and smoke alarm batteries, which again is fairly reasonable. You wouldn't expect a, a landlord to send out an electrician to, set, to, to change a light bulb. It's because it's quite easy enough done and, and sorted. So there shouldn't be any reason why that they can't do that. Smoke alarm batteries, exactly the same premise. However, if those batteries are on a fixed wired unit or if they're in a sealed lithium unit, then realistically that should come under the landlord responsibility. Um, so it's something to kind of like highlight in your reports when you're, you're doing your inventories, your check-ins, as to the type of alarm that is there, whether it's fixed wired, whether it's battery driven, whether it's um, a sealed unit. So then again, responsibility from a tenant landlord point of view is very, very clear. Um, reporting problems and repairs to the landlord as soon as possible, that is key um, for any tenancy, because the quicker the land, um, landlord is told about it, quicker they can get it um, sorted and, um, and fixed, and hopefully then, then there's going to be no ongoing issues from there. The longer things are left to um, fester, to uh, uh, the problems to accumulate and, and get bigger and bigger, then it becomes more costly um, and potentially more of a safety issue. So again, from a check-in point of view, I'm always saying to tenants, you know, if there's any problems, um, use the system that either the uh, agent or the landlord has provided for you to say about your maintenance um, and make sure you use it, you know, let people know. Uh, Susan, um, if the alarm is out of reach, e.g. above stairs, is the tenant still is it, does tenants still have responsibility? Mm, that's a good point because at the end of the day, you, you don't want the tenant doing the one thing that we wouldn't do is inventory cards and go climbing um, and um, potentially hurting themselves. I suppose if it can be done safely um, and um, that the, the alarm isn't one of these places where the, it's so, so high, you'd need like big step ladders or, or even, you know, some kind of staging in order to be able to get up there, then I think it's reasonable. And most properties are within um, a, a reachable height or height by using a small step ladder. But I think if it's certainly anything more than that, then again, I would maybe be referring that back to um, the landlord because it's a safety issue, especially if you've got um, the ones or the kind of properties we've got um, in Portsmouth. And um, we have a lot of like two up, two down properties. So when you go up the stairs, they're quite steep. You get a very small patch of landing and then you've got the loft hatch and the smoke alarm up there. So to try and even get stair, uh, ladders up there, it, it can be quite precarious. So you've got to think of a safety point of view from that. Um, I don't think it's for us to advise the tenant to 
get on a set of ladders and, and do that, but certainly say to them, look, it's your responsibility. However, if there is a reason why you can't get up there, it could be because they're not physically able to, then that should be referred back to the landlord. Um, I don't think there's a very um, kind of like black and white, as it were, answer, but hopefully that gives you some kind of idea. And certainly I would be referring back to the, the landlord, certainly if I couldn't reach it, it you know, safely. Um, but often I get um, tenants asking me, I've got like a big Manfrotto camera stand that I use and it's got like a rubber tip on the end. So it extends to about five, four or five feet and I'm five foot three, I'm dinky. So I don't reach much anyway. And um, with that uh, stick, because it extends out, that is more than enough to test the alarm and to get access to it. And quite often tenants will ask me, does that come with the property? And I'm like, no, but I let them know where I can get where I've got mine from so they can hopefully go and get one themselves if they need it. Because if you think about it, we're asking to test it, but we actually don't give them anything to be able to test it with. Um, so it's very much a case of finding like, the broom handle or the little stick with a hand on it, you know, to be able to do that. So it's about just giving some general advice and then um, then referring back to the uh, landlord or agent. That, at least that's what I would do. Um, and then finally, returning the property to its original condition, cleanliness and check out less fair wear and tear. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So. I get a bit frustrated with fair wear and tear personally, because it, again, it's so subjective because what is fair um, and what you can um, put down as fair wear and tear can be quite difficult because you've got to know how long the item has been in use, how many times it's, it's been in use, how long has it been there, what does it cost, what's the lifespan of the item to be able to really understand what fair wear and tear is. So I try and keep away from that. I try and look at it from a point of view. Is it its original condition? Is it clean? Because clean, cleanliness against damage is completely different. Cleanliness is something that is certainly within most tenants remit to be able to um, um, do something about and to be able to um, make sure that when they give the property back, that it is clean. That is not a particularly difficult thing, but certainly where carpets wear out or wear thin because of use, um, then you, know, you are going to experience it not to necessarily come back in its original condition similarly when you've got walls you know you're going to get scuff marks we all I mean I'm looking around my property now and I can see a few scuff marks a few stress cracks um you know a little bit of dust here or, or, and there which is rather annoying because now I just want to dust and um you know so you you expect a certain amount of that there's a there's a reasonable level but I think if you're going into a property and it's not clean, it's clearly not being maintained. There are great big chips out of the skirting. There's really um, extensive marks on all the walls, more than you would normally expect, maybe for the length of the tenancy, for the amount of people that have been um, in the property, then that necessarily wouldn't be giving it back in its original condition. So therefore, using the terminology fair wear and tear, then that would say, well, no, that isn't fair wear, that's gone beyond that, that's now going potentially into the damage area. So um, it's very much about making a conscious and um, informed decision based on what you can see at the property. But certainly with regard to the tenant responsibility side of things, it is for them to return the property as much as it's in the original condition and certainly um, clean or as clean as they got it. Um, again, I am seeing properties uh, being given over where they've not been clean. And then when they get be given back, the landlord's going, well, it's not clean, I want it clean. Or so you didn't give it over that way, which is why the inventory report and the checkout report is so vital because you need that comparison. You need that ability to say, well, okay, this is what it looked like and this is how it now looks. Um, and then at least then the tenant from their point of view, they know where their responsibilities lie and they understand exactly what that means in regards to uh, the cleaning side and any damage. And then should it go to dispute, there's a fair understanding of exactly what is actually in contention. And then, you know, hopefully they will come to a, a reasoned um, agreement from that. So the tenant doesn't absolve, um, absolve themselves of responsibility. It's not all a case of the landlord. Landlord has more material responsibility and safety responsibility, where the tenant is more about keeping the home in good order, clean, tidy, pet, uh, pest free where possible, maintaining it to a reasonable standard and making sure that if there are any issues, landlord is told and made aware. So at least they can do something. Um, we get a lot of reports um, where the um, either the tenant hasn't maintained it or the landlord hasn't maintained it and then everyone gets into a, a very big argument as to who is, is responsible for that so that's why your reports are so key so 
how do you know whether the tenants actually not looked after the property? Um, sometimes it's very evident, sometimes it's really, really clear, sometimes it's not. So if we look at the, um, the signs that maybe something's not quite right and maybe that your property, rental property is playing hide and seek with you. Um, one of my favorites is tenants stood in one place during the checkout. Happens so many times. And you can immediately see that something's not right because they won't move. Doesn't matter where you pivot and walk around them, they won't move. They're, they're steadfast where they are. Um, I've had that once um, where a tenant did that in front of a hob. And it's a, a, a case in point I use for the training. Um, and they stood there and they talked and they were chatty and they're really, really nice. And no problems at all in that respect. Very helpful. Answered any questions, but they just wouldn't move. And when they did eventually move, they literally moved away and left. Literally within you know, seconds, it was like, yep, bye, we're done, out. I went, okay. As soon as we looked at the hob, great big crack in the hob. And so we, so the clerk, because it wasn't me who found it, it was one of my clerks, they rung me. I rung the agent, rung the landlord, let them know. And sure, uh, uh, as it was expected, the tenant was, oh, nothing to do with me. It wasn't like that when I left. But because we literally jumped on it straight away, we were able to quite clearly showcase the fact that it, yeah, it was there at checkout. It's just that the tenant was trying to keep us out of, you know, trying to keep us from seeing it. I don't understand why, because it's going to get picked up. You're better off just saying so. And at least then it can be dealt with. You know, it's not going to go away. It's one of those things that, you know, is going to go to dispute if you keep um, disputing it all the way through. And we had the evidence. We had it date and timed in the report. So it was evident. But it's not just about, you know, cracked hobs, etc. cetera. Um, but it could be burn marks. It could be, um, we've had paint splashes, um, mascara, especially in bedrooms and lipstick marks, any kind of mark the tenants either not being able to get out or replace or repair, or they're just hoping you don't notice, um, you know, we've seen. And we've already had, we've actually had one tenant where they've actually cut a carpet in the shape of an iron, where they'd obviously made a burn mark, they'd actually gone all the way through the thread down to the uh, sub flooring. Um, and they'd managed to get a bit of carpet and cut it out and put it in. And to be fair, they made a really good job. It really took a, a while for us to actually see it. But the key thing, the reason we, why we saw it is because the tenant didn't move away from that spot. And they had like a foot on it and hoped that we didn't notice. And it was only because they'd done that, it really drew our attention to it. And we made sure that we went and had a look um, and did it from different angles until we could actually see it. Um, they'd actually glued it down and glued it really well, to be fair. But um, at the end of the day, it's still damaged, still needs to be highlighted. So any tenant standing in one place during the checkout, it should be sending alarm bells. And I'm sure it does already, but you know, if not, and you're new to um, the uh, inventory business, that's a sure sign, something's not right, go and have a look, have a look around them and um, try and get them to move. And if they don't move, then wait until they leave, then go straight away, look at it. And if you find something, then let everybody know straight away. And then that way, then um, we don't have this kind of awkward conversation like it wasn't me, it must have been the clerk. We've had that before as well. So I'm going to take a drink. Strategically placed mats. Get that all the time, all the time. Um, and one of the key things that I always seem to pick up is the fact that they're never in the right place. So um, I wouldn't say that I'm any good at styling houses or anything along those lines. Um, but, you know, mats kind of like go in certain places. They look right in certain places. So, you know, to make the, the whole room um, look really nice. Um, but often I'll find mats are in the wrong place. They're either by the door. So when you open the door, the mat comes straight up or they're right in the corner of the room, which means they're not doing anything. It's like, why are they there? So anything like that, anything that doesn't look right, you should be looking at, but you should also be looking under the mat anyway. Um, just peeling it from one side to the other, having a good look around underneath, taking a photograph, just checking to make sure. And as you can see in this picture, prime example, uh, tear, you know, it's damaged underneath there, right by the door. It could be through wear. That could have been something that was already previously picked up on the inventory and uh, it's just through use. So it's not necessarily the tenant's fault, but the fact that they're trying to hide it kind of makes you think, well, why are you hiding it? So have a look under your mats and also look at and said where those mats are. Um, and another tip is when you've got a furnished room and the mat isn't in the place where it was originally 
uh, in the in the picture. So we take two overall room pictures so that um, if anything has moved, anything's changed, anything's missing, anything's been added, it's kind of immediately um, obvious because within the inventory base app, you can see the pictures and you can go in and have a look and go, ah, something's wrong there. Uh, you know, I'm, um, you know, something's moved and I don't know why it's moved. I need to have a look. So it gives you, gives you that visual prompt. Um, we talked about cracks in the hop. Uh, the one that I dealt with and the, the, the um, one I mentioned was quite evident, but often they're not, they're really faint. And what I do find sometimes with tenants, what they'll do is they'll smear the hob, they clean it, but they'll leave residue on it on purpose so that you can't see that. And we've seen that before. So be careful. Obviously, you don't be running your finger around the hob because if it's sharp, you could hurt yourself. If the hob is electrified, if it's a halogen induction hob, you don't want to cause yourself any damage, but have a good look around. Take a, diff a few different shots. Um, try and use your flash as well on the uh, hob as well, because quite often that will showcase where the cracks are, um, especially if they're you know, hairline cracks and are not so obvious. Um, but where they're smeared, it's not always evident, but the fact is that they are smeared, they've got residue on them, make sure you note that. Don't just kind of like think, oh, well, it's clean. It may be clean, but it also might be damaged. And if you don't kind of mention the fact that this has got residue and smeared on it, then the client said, well, you clearly didn't look and it, was, it must have been obvious to you because you've not mentioned it. So I would always mention that. Cluttered worktops, especially during interim inspections, um, often are a sign of damage. And um, we found great big holes, burn marks into worktops, split worktops or worktops. I found one that looked like it'd been used a bit more like a dartboard than anything else. Great big um, cut mark scratches, holes in them. And yeah, it didn't make any sense as to why that that was the case, but they were. But because it was so cluttered, it was really difficult to see and sometimes um, people live like that and it does happen, but I'd still mention it on the interim, but sometimes you can look at something thinking that's quite strategically placed, you know, that the, the, where the item is or a pan has been left and all of the rest of the uh, worktop actually is not cluttered, but it's got a pan in a, in a weird place. So you go and have a look or, you know, ask questions and try and elicit as much information as you can do, you know, play detective as it were because it will stand you in good stead when it comes to say checkout, where you've had the interim, you think something's not right, and then you go to the checkout and lo and behold, exactly where you thought there was a problem, there is one. So you've got a line of evidence, you've got a line of information you can refer back to, to say, actually, I think this is pre-existing or uh, from the interim because of, whereas if you don't note these things down, then you can't rely on them. So I hope that makes sense. Hairline cracks in glass, really, really, really difficult to see. And these ones are uh, often the, the one thing that a lot of, I see a lot of uh, clerks get, not necessarily wrong, but get caught out by um, because they are so difficult to see. Some of them are very evident, some of them are really clear, and you know, sometimes they just get missed. But what I always say to people is look at the windows from different angles, look at it from the outside. Uh, in, vice versa, different angles, different light sources to see. Um, we had one tenant who had actually shattered the whole of the outside glass. It was like tempered kind of glass. Um, it was thicker than your normal uh, 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 UPVC kind of frame. Um, so what they've done is where they cracked and damaged it, they literally took the whole pane out and then taped around it in the same kind of color tape as the frame, hoping we would miss it. But because we look inside and out, we spotted it. And then you could see by the angle, you've actually got a whole glass missing. So of course, that's quite expensive for the uh, landlord to deal with. Um, so from that point of view, we we, you know, we found that, we were able to show that, showcase that to the uh, landlord and the tenant had to pay. Um, I mean, to be fair, they did again, do a good job. They took all the glass out. There wasn't any glass around. They taped all the edges. You really had to kind of like do a bit of investigative work. But again, it was the tenant kind of like being in the wrong place and kind of hovering around that and talking to us. And it almost felt like they were trying to deflect our attention. So for me, that was it. I wanted to know why. So, all, you know, always pay attention, look inside and out, look at different angles um, and just double check to make sure. 
broken thermostats. Um, this is something we're finding um, quite recently, actually. I think we found about two or three so far. And what, what the, the tenants have done is they've clearly broken, as this one you can see, it's actually broken and the uh, plastic's broken. But what they've been doing is they've been putting it back and, and stabilizing it on the, uh, on the actual uh, pipe work where the thermostat should be. And to the, to the immediate eye, it's not immediately obvious. But um, what was obvious is one of them was kind of off center and it wasn't quite right. So we had a look and you do your normal thing. You just kind of like touch it and then it came straight off on our hand. So that's how we found it. Um, but um, again, you know, this particular tenant really went to quite, quite great lengths to try and disguise it. But at the end of the day, we found it. But it doesn't always happen. We've had one where we didn't find it. Um, you can't be going around, I would argue, you know, touching everything, screwing everything, you know, you'd be there forever and a day, but certainly, you know, pay close attention to those, have a look at them, because that is going to be expensive for the landlord to replace, and if it's down to the tenant, because they've broken it, then they need to pay for it, equally though, it could be um, a fault in the unit, it could be age, it could be a stress crack that's just got worse and worse and worse, and the more the thermostat's used, then it's, it's just broken. Um, um, but you'll only know that by having that conversation with the tenant and also noting it in your report. Burn marks. Burn marks are the bane of my life. They're a real pain in the bum because sometimes, as you can see with this type of carpet, it's not always evident. That picture, you think, oh, if there's a burn mark, it's quite, it's quite evident. I've got my finger there, you can see it. But when you go into the room, you can't always see it. And it literally, it's only a case of, because we, took, we take um, multiple pictures of the carpet um, at checkout to see, because the, the, uh, the camera will pick up, um, the uh, device will pick up um, any issues, any variances that we could actually see it. And then when you get closer and closer and closer to it, then you can find it. But sometimes it's a case of you have to run your finger across it to actually feel, well, what is it? Is it a furniture indent? Is it a burn mark? Um, it's not always clear. So always pay attention to those. Um, and again, take multiple pictures of the carpet to get um, a bit of a different view because what your eye picks up and what your camera picks up does differ. If you don't need those photographs, then you can just delete them, which is easy enough to done. But if you don't have them, then you've got nothing to refer back to. Um, some um, pictures are gonna be quite evident and I'll show you one in, in, a, in a moment um, of, you know, of burn marks are quite clear, but others not so much. So it's a case of making sure you have a really good look. So some of the issues that are not easy to detect, uh, detect items under the bed or the back of wardrobes. Um, you can only do so much. You can only see so much underneath the bed. If the mattress is easy to maneuver, you can see below the slats or you can see under the, the bed, but sometimes you get them so they're really quite far down. Um, or maybe the bed is made up um, and you just can't get access to it or you'd have to literally be crawling on the floor to have a look. You know, you've got to be aware of your own health and safety here. I wouldn't suggest you do that because, you know, that's going to be no good for you. And you can only sometimes see certain um, areas behind the wardrobe. But, you know, the main thing is you've attempted to, you've tried to. And if there's something there you're not quite sure of, then take a picture of what you can see and then, you know, make a note of it in your report to say, you know, something's there, but you're not quite sure. Um, small chips and cracks into sanitary wear, sometimes they can be so, so fine, it's really difficult to know. And again, I wouldn't advocate running your hand all over it to try and find it. Again, use your angles, use your, um, your camera um, uh, light, use the light in the property, you know, make sure the lights are on in the room to see what you can see. Um, and that's as best as you can, to be honest, as you can do. Um, Feces in long grass. I've lost count how many times I've trodden in things I really wish I hadn't. Um, again, long grass, especially if it's patchy, kind of will probably give you an indication, maybe something there. Just be careful, just be aware of it and always have something, another pair of shoes or slippers or something in the back of the car, just in case. Um, I've once trod in um, scat, which is what you get from foxes and it smells to high heaven. Um, and yeah, that is really not nice. So just be careful of your footing. Um, and again, use your camera to you know get zoomed in and showcase if anything's happened there. And certainly if you think pets have been in the property or you know pets have been in the property, then look for that because the likelihood is it will be there. Um, doors off their hinges. Again, a lot of uh, 
properties I've come across where door looks absolutely fine, go to close the door to the frame to make sure that it's working, door comes off. So just again, keep an eye on that um, and check to make sure that it is, it, it, they are okay and they look attached, they don't look damaged before you use them. Um, small tears and rips of flooring, sometimes they're small nicks, you know, you, 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 they might be evident, they might not be, but big tears, as you can see in the picture to the left, um, some, they're, they're very evident. So again, make sure you take pictures of those. And if, even if there are small nicks, we take a picture of those because that gives the adjudicator the understanding that at say infantry, that's all existed. But now check out, we've got a big rip like this. So there's been a material change. So it's easier to understand, but you've got to be looking for these things. And sometimes they're not always evident. Um, standing to mattresses, um, really difficult to see if the bed is made up. Um, I personally um, do not unmake beds. That's not my job. Our job is visual. It's non-invasive. I'm not about pulling stuff apart. Again, we don't know what the bed's been used for. We've found beds and with blood products on it before. You know, I don't want to be putting my clerk at risk because of that. Um, so staining some mattresses uh, sometimes are hidden by being made up, and that's a, a bit of a difficulty um, from a report point of view. So all you can do is take a picture of the bed, show the fact that it's made up and, and say in your report that it's not been fully inspected because it is made up. Um, I hope that makes sense. And then hidden dangers, things like loose wiring where we've seen it, um, tenants have um, wired up uh, or bypassed the electrical um, unit and wired up to a different source in order to extract electricity um, for free, or they've rewired uh, switches and sockets um, rather than the landlord's contractor doing it so it's not safe. Um, so again, be aware of that, you know, be careful what you tread on. And if you've got loose wiring around the floor, be careful. Um, I've seen one of the other forums with Surveyor Hub, um, where a, uh, a surveyor unfortunately touched a wire, it was live, they got an electric shock off it, so be, be careful with that. So anything like that, take a photograph. If you're not sure, um, take a photograph, refer it so someone can look at it. And um, I mentioned sharps. I'm always saying to clerks, don't put your hands where your eye can't see. So don't go you know, kind of rummaging around into cupboards, looking into boxes, because you never know what's in there. You don't know if um, there's needles in there or anything sharp in there, you could get a needle stick injury. Um, and it's something that thankfully don't come across all that often, but when you maybe have got a, a checkout where the property hasn't been uh, looked after, maybe there has been drugs in the property, um, you know, there could be sharps there. You've got to put your safety first. So these are kind of signs that, you know, come across, people do come across, but not always easy to detect. So again, it's about keeping your eye out, keeping alert all the time, making sure you're always watching where you're going and what you're touching. So all's fair and wear and tear, is it? So examples of wear and tear, um, the, the, the list is exhaustive in some respects and it's sometimes very difficult to understand, but here are a few examples. You've got worn out keys and locks again, because they're used, fading furniture and curtains, especially curtains, you know, some fading happens a lot. You know, that, that's part and parcel of the property and how it is used because you, know, you can't really stop that from happening. You know, you worn carpet, your indents from furniture. People, you know, you walk on your carpet. I've got a cream carpet. It drives me nuts because I'm forever cleaning it because as soon as I'm walking all over or that someone forgets to take their shoes off, you know, dirt comes into the house and it's immediately obvious. But it's all part and parcel of, you know, living in a rental property. Um, loose hinges, you get a lot of that in regards to opening doors and cabinets, etc. Um, you know, it's, I think they're minor maintenance, something a tenant could actually deal with. But, you know, depending on the type of door type of hinge, it might need something a little bit more specialist, especially if it's one like it's a self closer or it's a perco chain. That would be a specialist. That would be something to uh, refer to the landlord. Um, cracked paint, sometimes paint due to its age will just naturally crack. It will wear, you know, houses, especially new ones will settle. So um, that is not unusual. If it's cracking to a huge degree, like you can see in this picture, there could be an underlying condition, mould or damp or some kind of issue that needs further uh, examination, investigation, that would be landlord. Um, dirty external windows. Some people say, well, surely a tenant's responsible for that. Yes, if they can get to them, but if they're in a, a, either a HMO or in a big block of fats or a high rise, they're not going to be able to do that. That's beyond their remit. 
you wouldn't be expecting a tenant to lean out of a you know, block of flats and clean the windows. You know, that is an external thing, same for the landlord. So again, just be mindful of that when you're reporting. And then appliances that are broken down due to age, you know, every item, as soon as it gets used and you know, it goes on year on year, it's got like more likelihood to break down and to um, become faulty. So that's uh, the tenant should then be letting the landlord know, um, hopefully either replacing it, refurbishing it or doing something about it. But examples of damage now, the, the picture is a little bit on the extreme side, but then again, we do see properties are kind of like along these kind of lines. But damage, you know, would be things like a missing keys and broken locks because they are within the tenant's um, responsibility and ability to make sure that that doesn't happen. Tears in curtains offers often that from cats and pets, um, climbing them and clawing them. Um, ripped stained or burnt carpets or flooring. That is totally within the uh, tenant's remit in regards to how they look after the property. And if you've got burns and stains and small ones or big ones or rips and tears, that says to me that you know the tenant hasn't been looking after the property as they should. So that is damage, that is not fair wear and tear. Um, badly painted surfaces and often what we see is um, tenants are actually repainting the walls um, but the paint is to such a bad state that the landlord's going to have to go in and do it again um, so that is actually kind of classed as damage that's not wear and tear because to be honest with you it's not down to them to change that color or paint that unless they've got permission and even when they have permission it should be done to a good standard uh, broken taps and broken windows. Again, these are within the remit of the uh, tenant to look after and make sure they don't damage. Accidents happen. You know, we're, uh, it's, you know, it's going to happen. It happens in you know, my house, I'm sure your house. It, it's one of those things, it does happen. But it's whether it's willful, whether they've done it on purpose, uh, that, you know, they've damaged the property on purpose or cracked the windows or broken the windows as opposed to having accidental damage. So it's about understanding exactly what that looks like. And you'll only get that by talking to the tenant, understanding um, the landlord's position and looking at what the evidence is in front of you. And things like cracks to surfaces and hobs and worktops, we've mentioned hobs already, but worktops as well in regards to that they've not been um, using surface guards, you know, hot pans, um, you know, using the worktop to um, act as a chopping board rather than using a chopping board. So you've got knife marks and, and scratches or large gouges. So stuff like that is damaged. And it's not necessarily willful are you, on purpose. You know, often it's just because tenant just hasn't thought about it. They've just done it and just thinking, well, it's all going to be part of the fair wear and tear, which it's not. So some of it is about education, not only the landlord, but also of the tenant. So what to report and when? Um, the main things, first of all, is making sure your report um, has clear descriptions, clear conditions, um, clear evidence. And I spotted a error there on my um, slide. Sorry about that. That will annoy me until I fix that. Um, but make sure you check out check out report has all that. Your infantry report should have it. So your checkout report should have that. That way then you can clearly determine what material change has happened. And then inform the landlord or agent of any urgent repair because you need to make sure the property is kept safe. So if it's urgent, it needs to be, you need to be calling from the property, letting the agent or the landlord know, and then making sure you secure the property and return the keys immediately. So then contractors can go in and sort out whatever the issue is. Um, now, mold and damage to the wall, walls are reportable however I wouldn't necessarily say they are urgent from a safety point of view but if you've got a leaking pipe then that is urgent because that could cause more damage um, it could cause damage to other parts of the building or other tenants depending if it's um uh, you know, flat or big block flats or HMO um, equally if you've got gas leak you wouldn't leave it you would let someone know so they could get dealt with straight away. So that is something that is immediately reportable, immediately a safety risk and needs to be dealt with straight away. It can't be left. Whereas, as you can see in the picture, damaged walls from mold, peeling paper. Yes, it's a problem, but it's not something that you need to be saying straight away. Not less, of course, another tenant's coming in literally within um, you know, a couple of hours or within the same day or first thing tomorrow morning, then I would be reporting that because obviously there's not a lot of time to get those fixed. So it's about you and your service and what you wanna um, help your client to, to do. 
And then in order to turn that risk, what you want to know is, you know, is it a, an issue that's a, an immediate threat to life? So a gas leak, um, is it something that's going to be, be threatening the safety of both the property or the building or other residents or a, a, a building or something that's adjacent to where that property is, especially with gas leaks, because um, if they explode, then you can see huge amounts of damage, you know, loss of life. Um, you know, you, you need to make sure that someone's aware straight away. Um, Equally, asking yourself whether it's likely to cause damage to the property if left untreated, i.e. the leaking pipe, again, you would then say that that's something that you need to deal with straight away. Um, and you need to make sure that you've made uh, the managing agent and landlord aware, but also follow that up. Don't just kind of give the phone call and think that's done, that's fine, I don't need to do any more. Follow it up, uh, email, text, evidence in your report, when you're giving your keys back, make sure you tell someone exactly, again, what you've said, get their name, make sure that's all down. Because if anybody then comes back and says, you didn't tell me, or I didn't know, or you didn't tell us in a good time, you've got an evidence to say, yes, I did. I spoke to um, a negotiator A, I text them, I emailed them, I spoke to them when I gave them back keys, et cetera. And this is the time I gave back keys. Anything to basically limit the potential um, damage an issue to you, your reputation, because you're, you're then effectively accused of not um, helping and causing more damage because you didn't tell anybody. So, you know, when you're determining that risk, think about things like that as well. And remember, state what you see and note any changes. So evidence exactly what is the difference in material change between the original inventory and the checkout, um, and make sure it's clear and you've got all the pictorial evidence you need. Um, some people use video again, you know, whatever it is that you use, whether it's pictures or video, make sure it's very, very clear and you're giving context to whoever's reading the report so they understand what it is you're saying, they understand the, uh, the level of damage, level of issue and what needs to be done. Um, and again, make sure you let the landlord or managing agent um, or be aware of any threat to safety or security of the property. Often we find we can't secure a door, either there's a, a key broken in the door or there is another issue just meaning we cannot secure the property safely. So we let the agent know, tell them straight away, make sure they've got someone en route to fix that, get that property secure. And again, follow up with your emails, your texts, your calls, your notes, and also make note of any action you've taken. So certainly within my report, I will have a, 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 an additional field saying, let negotiator A know of the gas leak, followed it up by an email, let them know when they handed back um, keys and then noted in the report. So there's a belt and braces approach to that. Because again, it's all evidence should anything go wrong. So you can clearly and confidently say, this is what I've done. And I've tried to do everything I could to mitigate the risk. Then the onus then becomes onto the person who you gave that information to and whether they acted on it or not. And finally, always keep a record. Um, don't just leave it um, to chance that you've spoken to negotiator A and that's it follow it up, keep a record of it, put it in the report, especially if it's a checkout, so that it's very clear exactly what you've done, that's all date and timed, so you can showcase you know, when it was um, shared, so everybody is aware, and then hopefully then you shouldn't go far wrong. So um, I've gone slightly over the time. I hope that has been helpful. I hope there's some points in there that might have either resonated with you or you feel actually, yeah, I hadn't really thought about it that way before um, and that you can walk away with something actionable from today's webinar. If you do have any other questions, if you are um, unsure about any point or want to go over anything or, again, ask any other questions, uh, do feel free to put that into the chat. Or if not, you can see my contact details here. So you can contact me on the number shown. Um, you can email me either at academy at inventorybase.com or sean at inventorybase.com. Or you can also visit our website at academy.inventorybase.com. Um, Thank you very much indeed for joining me. I hope you found it useful and a copy of this uh, webinar will be available shortly and um, hopefully you'll enjoy the rest of your, your day. Thanks very much for joining me. Thank you.